You made your design choices, you prepped and cut your kit, now it's time to sew it all together. Simple enough, right? Probably, but can it get better? What do I do to ensure that it all goes as smoothly and quickly as possible? Hi, I'm Amy and I make things. In today's video, I'm making all my fine geese blocks and a bonus project to boot. Hang around, let's see what happens. Okay, you've done all the prep work and now it's time to sew and press and sew and press and sew. You get it. There's a lot of repetition in quilting. My biggest tip for this part of the process is to do as much as possible entirely before moving to the next step. Let me break down how I sewed this block for remixed geese. I had them cut in sets and I sewed them in sets. This kept me organized and I didn't spend more time sorting it all out later. The sets also gave me a way to mark time, to mark progress, which for me is important. It sort of acts like an automatic treadmill to keep me moving forward and motivated, like little mini goals within the larger goal of the completed quilt. So I first sewed all of wing A to the base triangle and then I finger pressed that piece back. Note, I did not go to the iron at this point. I find just pressing it back is sufficient and it keeps me from distorting any bias. Plus, I'm not creating another step in the process. Then I sewed all of wing B to the base triangle and finger pressed that back to make the actual pressing easier and less distorting. In any quilt, Evaluate your block or block steps and determine if there are steps you can combine or skip altogether. Do you need to press between each seam or will pressing at the end be enough? So I did that for all the flying geese, all 200 of them, and I piled them on the ironing board ready to press, and then I did. I carefully, working with bias here, pressed all the blocks keeping them in their sets as I went. Next, I sewed all the sets of geese into pairs and piled them neatly on the ironing surface as I went. Then, once they were sewn into their goosey pairs, I pressed all of those at once and now they're ready for layout and assembly. From start to finish, I think it took me about four hours total for everything. Now, I know not everyone digs working this way because you end up with giant piles of things to process all at one time. That can feel daunting. That's okay. This is what works for me and you'll find what works for you. Perhaps working in sets of 10 is more manageable for your time or space or mental space constraints. Batching tasks or steps is the key to my working quickly and not getting bogged down by having too many actions in play at the same time. Like sew and press and then sew again and press again. It's a lot. This of course is a very simple and straightforward block and they are all the same, so efficiency is easy. But the process. The process remains the same for any quilt or block regardless of how complex. Break it down, sew as much as you can before moving on. Next step, continue. For instance, if you're working with a complex block, like one of those fancy barn star sampler blocks, like this, or a block with many parts, you can use these steps within each block. This block is filled with half square triangles and square and a squares, squares and a square, no, one square in many squares, Components, half square triangles and other components. So you sew all the half square triangles and all the components that you can before moving to the ironing station. Then you press everything you can at once. Then you trim everything you need to all at once and repeat the process. The trick is to do as much of one type of action as possible each step of the way. Some blocks, they require switching tasks between each step, and that's okay. It's going to take longer to make those blocks and to make quilts from those blocks. If you're working toward a deadline, say for a gift for the holidays or a baby on the way, 
Just factor that into your timeline. String piecing is one of these processes. They really need to be pressed between each string addition. But I have a tip for those as well, and I'll share that in a couple of weeks. I'm working on an entire series of string piecing scrap videos. There are places you can speed up and places you need to take extra care about. Determining those places and maximizing your efficiency where you can will make the entire project flow more easily. At the top of the video, I mentioned a bonus project. And in the sewing footage, I'm sure you saw my little square blocks between flying geese sets and steps. These are leader enders, and I learned about them from Bonnie Hunter. How many times have you had to dig a triangle unit out of the sewing machine because it got sucked down into the needle plate? It's a pain, right? It's frustrating, it wrecks your pieces, and it takes time. Eleanor Burns taught me to use what she called, I think it was called a jumper. It doesn't matter. Some call it a thread spider or a thread catcher. A little folded piece of scrap fabric that you stitch through at the beginning and end of a line of chain sewing. It helps prevent your pieces from being chewed up in the needle plate. It's great, effective, I did it for years. Then I found Bonnie Hunter's blog and Bonnie asked what if and answered it in the most ingenious way. What if I used actual patchwork bits at the beginning and ending of those chain pieces instead of throwaway fabric? Hence, leaders and enders. Bonnie even has two books outlining the process. Patterns for quilts that she's made in between piecing for other things. Bonus quilts. Every year in July, Bonnie creates a new Leader Ender Challenge pattern, and it's a sew along, but it doesn't have to be all fancy. It can be anything. I have an abundance of two inch squares. Y'all, like, like seriously. So, where do I put them? <laughs> So these are always at hand and I just sew them together, lights and darks, lights and darks, and eventually those will be sewn into four patches and then those into larger units, all as leader ender pieces. It can be strips, it can be those cute little mini charm pack squares that you just can't resist buying at the checkout, but now you have a giant pile of them and don't know what to do. I also have this box of hand cut tumblers. I was gifted by a B member. They are wild, let me tell you. And I sewed all of these together, these, while I was piecing the blocks for Indigo Way. I pieced, I think there were three of those per block and I made 72 blocks, so that's what? 216 tumbler units for basically no effort. If you can't tell, I'm a huge fan of leaders and enders both for what they give me in helping my pieces not to get sucked down into the machine and bonus quilts. They make great, great donation quilts. Everything will be linked below, the books, the leaders and enders page, all of it. I promised to talk a bit about labels. I think this spring I will do an entire video about labels and why they matter in historic significance, but today I'm just gonna hit the high points. And the high points are this. Please, please label your quilt. Just trust me, it's important. For this quilt, I have one extra two block unit. So I will use that as my label. Labels don't have to be fancy. They do not have to be purchased or even an actual label, but they should be included on your work. Ideally, a label with as much information as possible quilted into the back of your work is preferred. But here, this is what you always want to include in some way. Level one, made by your full name and the date. Level two, made for whom, full name, made by, full name, and the date. And then let's go ahead and go level three. Made for whom, for what occasion, by whom, date, location, full names, guys, full names. 
please, please don't label your quilt made for Johnny by Mom. That's sweet, and it may mean the world to little Johnny, but it means nothing to anyone else. And I know, I mean, I can hear you right now, but I'm not making an heirloom quilt. Guess what? Neither were most of the folks who made the quilts that we have hanging in our museums. The ones that tell our history, but can give no credit to the maker and no context to the work. Your work, your quilts, your art is significant in time, in place, in history. Not just to little Johnny who loved his quilt. I use anything permanent to write on labels. The Micron pens. I really like the Faber-Castell Pitt pens. It's an India ink pen. I don't have one with me. Sharpie laundry markers. Plain old Sharpie. In fact, more often than not, I write directly onto the back of the quilt. All right, now don't clutch your pearls. I do this because it won't fall off or be removed like a stitched on, not in, but on label can. And if nothing else, I write made by Amy Dement, 2024, Austin, Texas. If I know who it's for right now, I'll write that in as well, but I can add it later if the quilt becomes a gift. For this quilt, since I'm thinking ahead, I'll press this extra goose unit onto some freezer paper for stability, and then I can write on it why it was made, this breakdown quilt along, my full name, location, and the date. I'll piece it into the backing so that it gets quilted in and becomes a permanent part of the quilt. I'm working right now with a friend who is a quilt historian to come up with a video interview about the significance and importance of labeling your quilts, but that's the gist, guys. And, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not especially good about this. But as I've seen more and more quilts and wondered about the makers and their stories, I'm getting better. Even if I do, result to a Sharpie. <laughs> okay, I've talked a long time. From here, think about your sewing breakdown. No, 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 <laughs> not that kind of breakdown. Where can you streamline the process steps by batching actions? I hope you'll try leaders and enders with some basic squares. They make fantastic donation quilts, and I hope you plan now on how you'll label your quilt. It doesn't have to be fancy, I promise. This week, the fun part. Sewing and pressing. And sewing and pressing and sewing. <laughs> Next week, we get to do layout and assembly, and I've got some tips about color and value placement that I hope you'll find useful. Let me know in the comments if you use leaders and enders in your sewing. I always think everyone knows about them, and I'm continually surprised and happy to share Bonnie's method. Everything I can link is linked in the description box, and while you're there, please click the buttons, like, subscribe, share. Check out the entire playlist for the quilt along, as well as my quick quilts for when you need a quilt now video. Don't forget to have fun with your sewing. And don't forget that you make the world more beautiful just by being in it. I'm Amy, and I'll see you next time.